Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jalen and I'm having the most fucking insane week of my life. Professionally, things are going well. Personally, like in my hobby life, um, I just received confirmation this morning that Otessa Moshfeg, queen of my entire life, is coming on my podcast next month. I don't have words for what this means as of right now, um, but I feel like I have to make it known everywhere because this is truly like the literary event of my life. Like, I've never been more excited for something in my entire life. I idolize the shit out of Otessa Moshfeg. I'm obsessed with her work. I'm obsessed with her. And the fact that I get to talk to her for an hour and ask her stuff, and she's like, yeah, let's do it. Like, what the fuck do you mean? What do you actually mean? It's wild. Anyways, if all things go as planned, the episode will be up October 14th. So not sure if anything will change. But as of right now, you can look for it in a couple of weeks. And so now the preparation begins. I received confirmation and then I was like, what am I gonna ask her? <laughs> because I don't know, like it, it's difficult with an author that's as established as her. Like, what do you ask? Because like, I've seen so many interviews of hers and I'm like, I don't know what I wanna do, but I'm going to work my little tushy off over the next couple of weeks and try to think of some original interesting questions and I hope it is just really good. Anyways, so I haven't been able to think or function since yesterday when this was like starting to happen and then this has since happened. So yeah, please, once that is published and out, it would mean the world to me if you watch it, leave a comment, follow the podcast and share it with your friends and stuff. I'm really hoping that this podcast becomes a thing. Like it feels... I've never been more excited about a project that I've done, like even more so than my YouTube channel. I love doing YouTube as well. But actually talking to authors and having like watched so many author interviews, like every night truly I watch like one author interview. It's a little wild, but I was then thinking like, why can't I do it myself? And I'm doing it. And it's kind of blowing my mind. And I know like those videos don't get as many views as say like wrap ups or what have you. And I'm still early on in my podcasting career, but I really want to make it a thing. And any like, listen, share truly helps. Leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, those things all help it reach more listeners. And I want to become like a literary podcast dude, you know? <laughs> so anyways, that is podcast and channel updates. I'm going to be losing my mind for the next few weeks about this goddamn interview. I probably won't shut up about it till next year, but that's what happens, you know? When you interview Tessa Moshfag, you interview your favorite writer, like, this is just fucking insane. Anyways, this video is going to be a fall reading Rex video. I recently did a fall TBR covering some books that I want to read this fall, but I also wanted to do a reading recommendation video. I haven't done one of these in a while, I think since my summer one, so last season. But spooky vibes, literary horror vibes, dark fiction vibes is my heart and soul. It's what I love to read. It's what I'm always looking for. And so I have this list of books that I've read over the last few years that I think really scratch that itch. And so if you're looking for some either pure horror or like dark fiction adjacent stuff, something on this list should do it for you. And then a couple other ones that aren't like horror or that dark. So first up, I'm going to start with some pure horror. It's Anybody Home. This is a book that is all about home invasion. So I myself, I grew up loving slasher films and one of my all-time favorite movies is a home invasion movie called The Strangers, which you might have seen. The book scarred me for life. The movie scarred me for life. <laughs> Truly fucking terrifying. Like, I, it's my worst nightmare is to be in my living room looking around and having some dude with a bag over his head behind me, like looking at me and then just going back into the shadows and I have no idea that's happening. I constantly think this is happening in my real life. I always think someone's watching me. So this movie really capitalized on my worst fears. And this book is told from the second person perspective. So you're put in the seat of a home invader that's learning the ropes from this master home invader. And so basically it says like, you do this, you go into the house, you follow the mom, you hide in the basement, you cut the cords of the internet, like what have you. You're placed in the seat of being the one that's actually committing this home invasion. But what's really interesting about this is that the book is exploring this idea of spectacle and why we are so entertained by violence. And part of the book is told from this idea of having people watching the final product of you recording this home invasion and killing a family in their house and doing it for sport and doing it in the most effective way possible. And this book is so disturbing and will get under your skin. I still, since having read this book, I can't stop thinking about 
the possibility of like someone walking outside my house or coming up to my door, leaving mail or what, what have you, and thinking that they're actually a fucking serial killer that's going to plan over the next like six months how they're going to get into my house and kill me. Like that's the kind of book that this is. <laughs> so that sounds like you don't want to be afraid of your house and I would like not recommend it. But if you like having fear implanted in your mind, then this is a book that you should definitely check out. Next up, I have The Sluts by Dennis Cooper. This book is one that shifted my brain, I want to say. It's probably the most original singular book that I've ever read in my life. It is an internet novel in which the book is set almost entirely in a bunch of these internet forums in which people review escorts, male escorts. Essentially, this book is told from a bunch of different posts in which people are reviewing this young guy named Brad. As the descriptions and the reviews keep coming, they get increasingly more violent. And there's this sort of lore that becomes a part or attached to Brad. And as the book goes on, there is a murder mystery. There are other people that come along in this fake or real Brad's life that start manipulating the narrative that's being told online. And so in short, what this book is doing is it's really looking at this idea of internet gossip. And this book was written in 2004. And the whole premise of the book is thinking about fact versus fiction. And when we put something in a written form, whether it be online or having a community contribution to a story, what can that do? And what does it mean to real life? And so throughout this book, you don't know what's real and what's fake. You don't know if certain incredibly horrific accounts of Brad are actually real. How does fiction alter reality? Okay, so the next book that I have on my list is Devil House by John Darneal. This is not really a horror novel, but it is a book that looks at true crime and it's metafictional in its telling. So it's told in seven parts and we follow this guy who's a true crime writer and his new venture, his new book is going to be about this place called Devil House and murders that were committed there. And so most of this book is him exploring this idea of writing true crime and being in this devil house and sort of occupying it, living there and figuring out how he's gonna write his next book. But the book is told in seven parts, as I mentioned, and the first and seventh, the second and sixth, the third and fifth, those parts sort of reflect each other. And then the middle part is a standalone weird section, but it's really metafictional in the way that it explores what it means to write true crime and write stories about real events. And this book really questions the idea of true crime generally. So it's thinking if a murder has occurred or a crime has allegedly occurred, and that's the one fact that we know, what does it mean to then write about those experiences and how can we get things wrong? And when we get things wrong or we try to paint our own picture of what has happened with these crimes, how does that impact people in real life? But then aside from all that, the book is also meta because it explores what that even means, <laughs> like about about trying to make a document that sort of identifies those issues, meaning this book Devil House, while also trying to truly testify to what happened in a crime. And is there still some validity in trying to explore why crimes happen or why are we so fascinated with them? And given our fascination, what does that leave out in those stories and what should be in there ethically as well? This book is quite long, so I would recommend if you're ready to like dive into it for a few days, or you just have the time you read like a 400 plus page book that's metafictional, so you can have to be aware of what's going on. I would recommend it for that. It is structurally really interesting, but I wouldn't go into this thinking that it's pure horror by any means. Um, it's more so true crime, but there are some really grisly depictions of crime in this book. So that is that one. Next up, I have Our Wives Under the Sea. This is a dark, queer, literary love story about grief. We follow this married couple, these two women who are living together and one of the wives has just returned from an expedition under the sea in a submarine. And when she was down there, her and some other passengers in the submarine doing the study of sorts were trapped down below for quite a long time. And the book opens with her having returned, but weird things are happening to her body. And there's clearly been an impact on her since she was stuck under the ocean for so long. The book is told from the perspective of Mary and Leah. And Mary is the wife who was home when her wife was away and her being worried about what's going on, having no communication with Leah and wondering what happened to her. And then Leah's sections are told and she's under the water and her experiences there and how that all builds up to her eventual return. What I think this book does so intricately and in a really intelligent way is explore this idea of how long-term relationships can change over a period of time and what the absence of a person 
can do to a couple and just to one's own identity. So this idea of Leah coming home and being a fundamentally changed person, given like the body horror descriptions is really discussing how in a long-term relationship, when someone's gone for a period of time or how someone changes over time, how that sort of impacts the grief for both characters and how that can fundamentally alter someone's relationship with another person. And I like the use of suspense through Leah's sections being under the water and not knowing what's going on. It's incredibly creepy and kind of had me like skin crawling a little bit because I am terrified of the ocean. I hate the sea and thinking about like what's deep down under there and being out of control, stuck in a submarine under the water, like sort of buried alive is so terrifying. But at the heart of this book is really this beautiful and incredibly sad queer love story. So if you want some queer horror, I would recommend that one for sure. Next up, I have two recommendations for like campus style novels that I think are perfect for fall. For me, I love reading a campus story during fall. And so those two are Sirens and Muses by Antonia Ingris and Either Or by Elif Batuman. And I think both of these will scratch that itch. Sirens and Muses is more so about art and politics and following four characters who, well, three of them are like in a love triangle of sorts. And the fourth character is a professor at this school and thinking about their own pursuit of love and art and ambition and how when you're in college and thinking through these questions, how different forces can play on your perception of yourself and your identity and your own art making, all the while being this really pacey and interesting character study of these four people. And I feel like of many of the books that I've read this year, this is one in which the character development was so singular in my mind that like, I feel like I know the characters in this book. And I often like think about this book in terms of the characters being sort of like real people, which is really interesting for me. So that's that book. And I also have an interview with Antonia Ingris on my channel as well, if you want some more in-depth discussion of the book to see if you want to pick it up. And then Either Or by Elif Botsman. This is a sequel to The Idiot, which I read, I think last year or earlier this year, I want to say. And Either Or to me is a much, is a significantly better novel than The Idiot in terms of its telling. This book is really exploring Celine's second year at Harvard. But what I love personally the most about this book is that it's less preoccupied with her love of the love interest in the first book, The Idiot, and more so her thinking about what it means to be a novelist in the pursuit of her own art and thinking about whether she wants to live an aesthetic or ethical life. She becomes enraptured by Soren Kierkegaard's book, Either Or, and it becomes the framework of her second year at college where she discovers sex and thinking about compulsory heterosexuality and how all of these questions sort of blossom for her. And it's also sort of the idea of Elif Batuman exploring her sophomore year experiences through an autofictional lens. The end of this book is one of my favorite endings in recent history, <laughs> a recent memory. It's her reading The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James and her mind sort of being blown by this idea of autofiction that I thought was so smart, so clever. And I was just like, hell yeah. Like overall as a contained narrative, I think either or is so much better than The Idiot. But if you like The Idiot, I highly recommend you try either or as well. Next up, if you're looking for a classic, I would recommend The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. The gay homoerotic undertones in this book are wild. I read this book back in freshman year of high school, I think, and I gave it five stars on Goodreads back then. And I recently reread it and I loved this so much. I picked this up because one of my favorite writers, Sheila Hetty, she had it in her top 10 list of books. And I was like, you know what? I should probably reread The Picture of Dorian Gray. And I was in the mood for like a gothic e style book. And this book is so lushly written that I was just so enamored with it and its ideas of art and beauty. And thinking about this fleeting quality of beauty and how we're perceived by others, I think this book does this in such an interesting way with like perfect prose. And when you pick this up, it's incredibly dark and even more dark than I remembered it. And I also did the audiobook of this one, which is narrated by Russell Tovey. And the audiobook slaps, it is so good. So I recommend doing that one on audio if you're in the mood for audio as well. Next up, I have Pew by Catherine Lacey. And I recently got into Catherine Lacey significantly. So a couple weeks ago, I read The Answers by her. I then did a reread of Pew. So I read this book two years ago and I actually didn't really like it, but I just reread it and I loved it, which is really interesting. So this book follows this young person named Pew who arrives in this Southern Christian town and they are sleeping on a church pew and they're sort of this adrift character that we don't know much or at all about. And we come to learn that Pew 
does not have an identifiable age, gender, race, etc. And the people that find Pew on this church pew, they start to imprint their own biases and assumptions on Pew and start to force them to try to identify themselves to the people in this town. When I read this book initially, I was really put off by this idea of having this sort of passive narrator who doesn't really tell you anything about themselves and how, to me at the time, it felt like the different stories of the people around this town who start talking to Pew and give their own secrets and start confessing to Pew because of this sort of silent figure. I was sort of, I don't know, let down by it, but now on a reread, I love how Catherine Lacey plays with this form of having a narrator who doesn't really give you any signifiers to then let you see how the tertiary characters in this novel start to imprint themselves on Pew. It, it was something that really was kind of revelatory for me to kind of shift my perspective on why I needed things to be sort of spelled out for me. I think the book is really clever in how that's exactly what the book is trying to get at. And on a reread, I really enjoyed with more like reading under my belt to sort of understand what Catherine Lacey was really doing with this narrative. All I have to say, this book has a really sinister vibe. I would say it's quite Shirley Jackson adjacent in terms of it being kind of similar to like the lottery, but I wouldn't say it's as obviously dark. There's not really a huge act of violence that occurs in this book. It all builds up to something in this town, but I think the ideas that are presented in this novel about identity and how we're perceived by others is the core of this book, and I think the setting and the tone is perfect for fall. Okay, next up I have This Thing Between Us by Gus Moreno. This is a book that's really exploring grief significantly and the horrific nature of grief. This book was really marketed as like a tech horror book in which the blurb or the synopsis says that there is a haunted Alexa, which is true, like that's in the book, but this book is way more so about grief. And there's a lot of really interesting and beautiful and heartbreaking passages about grief in here, in which we follow this married couple and the wife she passes. The rest of the book is about this haunting that occurs. And it really becomes this exploration of the husband grappling with grief. When I read this book last year, I described it as like Joan Didion meets Black Mirror meets Stephen King, like Pet Cemetery vibes. So put those three in a blender and you get this book. And it's a very quick, pacey read, very weird, very surreal by the end of it, but I think it is really, really excellent with some great writing as well. So that's that one. Next up, I have one of my all time favorite books. It's Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. This is a book that I included because I think sometimes, at least in fall, it's really a perfect time to dabble in a family saga and it's just a big tome of a book. And this is a book that when you pick it up and if you're in the mood for like a family saga, you can't put it down. It is so rich in its characters and its explorations of personal autonomy and religion and familial expectations. I think Jonathan Franzen is truly a master at writing families. I've read this one in The Corrections and I think both are just absolutely fantastic novels that explore really fraught family dynamics and a huge page count, I will say. These books do take up a good amount of time to read, but I think Jonathan Franzen on the sentence level is exquisite and also in his construction of characters and family and the multitude that those can contain in a novel, I think he's the best one doing it. So if you're looking for a big book to sink into, this is a perfect one. I also think it's perfect for winter. This book is mostly set on Christmas Eve Eve, so there's an argument to be made that this book is maybe best for winter, but it, something about this book, despite that, just gives autumn vibes. I mean, the cover is giving autumn. The tone and vibe of it feels quite fall to me. So. That's my recommendation for a big family saga. Next up, I have Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch by Rivka Galchin. I really like this book. This is a book that is set in the 1600s and we follow this woman who cannot read or write. And so she's telling her story to her neighbor about her being on trial for being a witch. While this book is historical fiction, there's a really modern bent to this book's telling and how the book seems to me and my recollection really preoccupied with uh, community gossip. So I will say this book is kind of not similar in, in style or telling at all to The Slots by Dennis Cooper, but there is something thematically between these two that I think is really interesting and in how in the search for a scapegoat in certain times and the sort of community gossip and the stories that we tell each other about people, how those can kind of bleed over into reality when people believe that this woman is a witch. And so I think if you want a darkly comedic historical fiction novel that has a sort of modern bent that also, you know, deals with witches and the falsity of that, I think this is a perfect uh, fall read as well. Next up, I have my king, Brendan Taylor, in his collection, Filthy Animals. I think his novel, Real Life, is a perfect summer book. 
And then Filthy Animals is the perfect like cardigan on reading short stories queer longing style of the book. Um, a lot of these stories are interconnected following this couple and their open relationship and our primary character that we follow as he gets involved with this couple. And there are a couple of standalones as well, but I think what Brandon Taylor does so well as a pro stylist is really evocative of this idea of longing through setting and through his character development and just through the way he kind of frames his various scenes. I often attribute Brandon Taylor to being like the king of writing dinner parties and the sort of fraught and weird dynamics that can kind of be unearthed at a dinner party. I think he's so good at that. So if you're looking for something that's sort of like queer, you want short stories, you want some messy relationships, gorgeous writing that's very like, it's very rich in its scene setting and just its style, I would say this is a perfect collection to try. And then the last recommendation I have is Queen, aforementioned Queen, Otessa Moshfeg, and my favorite book of hers is Death in Her Hands. And I think this is, for me, like the best fall book. It's one of my favorite books of all time. So <laughs> understandably is the perfect fall book. But this one, if you're unfamiliar, it follows an older woman named Vesta. She's in her 70s and she is a recent widow and she's living alone in a secluded house by herself with her dog, Charlie. And one day she's taking her dog for a walk in the woods and she finds this note. And the note indicates that a woman named Magda has been murdered and that no one's going to find out who did it. And this sends Vesta into a spiral that is the rest of the novel. Her trying to figure out who left this note for her, why is it there? Her also thinking about her marriage and her relationship with her deceased husband and thinking about the stories, again, that we tell ourselves and how those stories can sort of craft our reality and how that can kind of spin out of control, especially for this woman who is older and secluded and the loyalties that she's finding with her dog and the very fraught past that she has with her husband, how that all comes to a boiling point as she tries to solve this mystery that may or may not exist. This book to me is all about mind spaces and thinking about storytelling. And there's some meta aspects in here about how Moshfeg explores the idea of creating a mystery and creating characters that are unlikable. And she sort of addresses that very explicitly in certain parts of this book that I love to read. But I think even aside from that, like the aesthetic vibe of this book is just so perfectly me. Like this idea of a murder mystery in the woods with a woman that's sort of like losing her mind and trying to figure out what's going on. It's just like exactly what I would want to read in a novel. And then also having that meta layer onto it of understanding how the story is being crafted as you read along in the book. It just all comes together so perfectly and the ending is just phenomenal in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of questions that are raised by the end of the book and I just love the way that it's crafted and how it all ties up together and it was really fun to reread this one as well. But hopefully you find something in this pile that you really like. If you have any fall reading recs to give to me based on this list, I would love to hear them. I am trying to figure out what I want to read next. I'm currently reading actually Sula by Toni Morrison and this should be on this list as well. So here's an extra recommendation. This is a horror novel so far. I was not, this is my first Morrison fiction, I was not expecting this to be as dark as it is. Um, this is like a weak comparison and I mean this only like superficially, but this book is kind of giving me like Hereditary, the film, but like Remove the Demon, but like that very overwhelming claustrophobic feeling and some of the scene setting here is wild. Um, I was like shook by some of these scenes creeped out and like just got under my skin a little bit and how they're described. I don't know, this book is entirely gripping and it, it's just, I was so shocked at how dark this one gets. So I'm very nervous to see how this ends, but I would recommend this as well. I was going to read Beloved for Fall. I think I'm still going to, cause I'm loving this. Um, but I know that one's considered to be like her staple horror book, but I think this one would kind of fit that bill too. I'm not sure if all of her work does, but yeah, this is a dark one. And then I also recently got an arc of the new Mariana Enriquez book, Our Share of Night, which is out in February. But I would like to read this this fall because this is a big boy and it is about a woman's mysterious death puts her husband and son on a collision course with her demonic family. Hell yes, that sounds so good. It's huge. I would like to get an, a big book done this year. I haven't really read too many big books and I feel like this is the perfect one. And the cover's giving Ken Petra's as well, which I love. So that's that. But yeah, if you have any recommendations, as I mentioned, please let me know. Let me know your favorite book to read for fall. I would love to hear it. Yeah, keep an eye out for the Otessa Moshfeg interview next month. I am, as the kids say, shaking, crying, throwing up. And until the next video, I will catch you all in the next one. Bye.